From our studios in New York, this is a special edition of Charlie Rose. Tonight we continue our exploration of the wonders of the human brain. Our subject this evening, creativity. We have been fascinated by creativity for centuries. The ancient Greeks believed that inspiration comes from the four muses. During the Middle Ages, philosophers separated artistic creativity from other kinds of ingenuity. Creativity came to be thought of as a unique skill that only certain people had. Today, we're rethinking creativity once again. We now know that creative talent is not only reserved for the special few. Instead, it is a crucial part of every profession from acting to engineering. Tonight, we will explore the sources of inspiration that we can all find within ourselves. We will learn about the biological basis of creativity. Like every other aspect of human experience, it originates in the brain. We'll also look at the connections between creativity and mental illness. In order to help us understand the creative process, we turn to two of the most talented artists working today. Richard Serra. He is a sculptor best known for working with massive sheets of metal. His work breaks away from the traditional definition of sculpture and places an emphasis on the experience of the viewer. And Chuck Close. He is a painter whose oversized portraits feature incredible attention to detail. His work is all the more remarkable considering that he suffers from a rare disease that makes him unable to recognize faces. Also joining me is the world-renowned neuroscientist Oliver Sacks. He has written extensively about creativity. His latest book is called The Mind's Eye. Like Chuck Close, he's also succeeded despite lacking the ability to recognize faces, a condition called face blindness. And Ann Temkin, she is chief curator of painting and sculpture at the Museum of Modern Art in New York City. She will share with us several works by Mr. Sarah and Mr. Close that help us understand their unique gifts as artists. And once again, my co-host is Dr. Eric Kandel. As you know, he is a Nobel laureate, a professor at Columbia University, and a Howard Hughes medical investigator. I'm very pleased to have him here as we talk about this remarkable function of the human brain, the capacity to be creative. Where does it come from? It comes from the brain. <laughs> the brain has enormous creative capabilities, and as you indicated, it's not limited to art, although we see it in exquisitely refined form in art. It's evident in many aspects of human activity. And we're going to have a chance to explore this with Chuck Close and Richard Serra, who are spectacular examples of creativity in art. And this is an interesting turning point in our work together in this series. In the first 10 programs, we discussed how different human mental processes come from the brain. And then we began to ask the question, to what degree can one bridge between brain science and other bodies of knowledge? In the last program, we took economics as an example, and we discussed decision making. And we saw how insights in the biology of decision making can enlighten our understanding of how we make economic decisions and even moral decisions. That was the simplest case because we know a lot about decision making. We're now going to the other side of the mountain, the most complex human activity of creativity, to see what sort of insight we can get. And one of the amazing things about this as we speak about Richard Serra and Chuck Close is they themselves do not use the term creativity for their own work. They see themselves as problem solvers. They see themselves very much as scientists do, that they define a particular area they want to work on, they develop techniques for approaching it, and as they reach one impasse or another, they try to solve this. Chuck Close, as you indicated, works on a much smaller scale than Richard Serra, but still, gigantic portraits. Everybody works on a smaller scale than Richard Serra. <laughs> <laughs> but gigantic portraits, photorealistic portraits, but he focuses in on the little details on them. It's like a mosaic, pixel by pixel. He f paints them in different colors in order to put the image together. Richard Serra works on enormous scale, works in steel, works with ellipses and torques in which you walk along them and you walk between them. So he's also concerned, as you indicated, in the beholder's response, how people emotionally respond to the fact that they're walking into the unknown. If you now ask yourself, how did they develop their creative process? You see they developed it in very, very different ways. 
My guess is Richard Serra could have done other things besides being a sculptor. He, in fact, was a very good painter for a while. And he worked in a steel foundry when he was young, and he began to work with other materials and finally made these wonderful, gigantic steel uh, sculptures. Chuck Close took a very different approach. He is dyslexic, as you indicated, uh, and he felt that there were many things he couldn't do. The one thing he could do very well is to draw. And he particularly became interested in drawing and painting faces. Now, this is extremely interesting because he is face blind. He is probably the only artist in the history of Western art who is, paints portraits without being able to recognize individual faces. And how does he do it? He takes a, a picture of it, so it flattens it out, which is easy to deal with. And uh, Oliver Sacks will explain that to us. And then he pixelates it. He puts a grid over it, makes small squares out of it, because he can deal with small forms much more easily than large forms. And he then puts all this together. So they take two very different approaches to the art. And Ann Temkin is going to explain to us how these two emerge out of the contemporary tradition of art. And Alva Sachs is going to tell us something about the neurobiological underpinnings. Let me just give you an outline of that. We learn a lot from people who have compromised to their cognitive function. And we learn a lot from people like Chuck Close. In fact, it turns out that people with dyslexia are, can be quite creative. There's an enrichment of creativity among people who are dyslexic, just like there is an enrichment among people who have manic depressive disorder or autism. And from dyslexia, we get an insight into the brain regions involved. Dyslexia is a difficulty in reading and in arithmetic. That's represented in the left hemisphere of the brain. The left hemisphere is concerned with language, with logic, with orderly organization of ideas. The right hemisphere is thought to be concerned more with fantasy, with musicality, with imagination. And Hewling Jackson, the founder of British neurology in the middle of the 19th century, had an idea that the two hemispheres of the brain, although they're symmetrical, are involved in different functions, and we know that's a fact. He thought they inhibited one another, so that if you have a compromise to the left hemisphere, as you do in dyslexia, you can free up creative elements of the right hemisphere. So one of the reasons people with dyslexia might be more creative, this is just an idea, is that they free up creative potential that is latent in the right hemisphere. And there's independent evidence from normal people Cunius and Beeman, two young investigators taking different approaches, have found that if you solve a problem with an insight, an aha phenomenon, a eureka phenomenon, a part of the right hemisphere, the right superior temporal gyrus, lights up. So this is still very soft evidence, but we're beginning to focus in on aspects of the right hemisphere as being particularly important in creativity, and we'll see this as we discuss it more with Oliver Sacks. Creativity is not simply limited to artists. It can be scientists. It can be athletes. It can be business people. It can be. I think one of actors. the things you point out, you had on, you know, the coach of the Duke basketball team, and you ask him, how do you bring out creativity in your players? There's creativity involved in every aspect of life. But many people either don't have the time to focus in on it or free themselves up or don't have the intrinsic capability. There are genes involved in this as well. One of the most remarkable things that I have learned coming with you through this. 12-part uh, look at the human brain is the notion that uh, the brain does so much more than we imagine, uh, and that's part of why it's on the frontier of science. You know, I, I didn't understand until we began to talk about this, you know, how the brain was central to the eye, it was central to walk, it was central to uh, a whole range of human emotion. It all comes from the brain. And Absolutely. now we talk about this most remarkable quality, the ability to be, to be creative, to think new ideas. Uh, the brain is a creativity machine. We spoke in an early program on vision, how the information coming through the eyes, through the retina, are incomplete for me to get a complete picture of Charlie Rose. You know, I see the outlines of your face, and I add additional features as a result of my exposure, my looking at faces, so this is what the brain recreates the outside world. It's and an amazing task. Let's go to a remarkable panel. Uh, we have had on this program uh, people who are, are living with brain uh,
disease or brain disorder, and now we go to people who uh, are noted for creativity as we explore with them this remarkable thing that our brain does, the ability to create. And help us understand Chuck and, and Richard in terms of, of creativity. Give us that sort of you know, historian's perspective. Well, in fact, although their work is so different one from the other, they're both products of a very similar environment in their formative years as artists. Um, Chuck's born in 40, Richard's born in 39. They both are becoming artists in their teens, in their early 20s, when abstract expressionism is the reigning dominant force in art. And this is, of course, the era of the bravado, virtuosic, masterpiece kind of philosophy about making heroic art. Right. For them, both of them at Yale, together, by the way, in the early 1960s, right. there was an absolute reaction against that. As much as you were wanting, in part way, to emulate the majesty and the grandeur of a Jackson Pollock or a painting by Bill de Kooning, there was also an absolute need to get away from that. Is there an explanation for why there have been bursts of creativity at certain places at certain times? Mm. Well, I think both of them could speak to that very much. There is no question that the myth of the isolated genius in the studio is quite inaccurate or incomplete, because I think the generation of these two and many others, whether you're talking about, in fact, the abstract expressionists or the French impressionists or um, Florence in the right. Italian Renaissance, it's the togetherness that is such an important factor. It's the rivalry with your colleagues. It's the desire to support each other. It's what you get from seeing what they're doing. It's talking and talking and talking. Creativity needs what? I think for people who are making and doing, when you're actually making and doing something, you don't think, I'm creating. That's not how, at least I don't. I don't think, oh, now I'm creating. I think that certain aspects of what I would like to find out about my own experience in doing and making um, lead to develop certain processes that will allow me to have a certain feedback that will allow me to continue. When I first started uh, in New York, I just wrote down a, a list of verbs and I decided that I would enact the verbs in relation to material, in relation to place, and in relation to sometimes even time. So I would take very simple things and I would either roll that up or lift a piece of rubber up and I would call them to roll, to lift, to hang, to bend, to tie, to dapple, to twist, or whatever. And I thought by just using a very simple transitive verb structure, it would allow me to enact processes and motor control in relation to material that would then allow me to proceed in a way that I didn't have to deal with the specifics of history. It would allow me to have an own intrinsic logic in relation to what I was doing, in relation to the perception of what was the residue of the activity. Now that doesn't mean that all activities and their residue are going to create something that is um, satisfying in terms of what you would call an aesthetic experience. Most of them not. But every now and then, you would have a moment where you would say, aha, I've done this, and this satisfies certain parameters of what I can then relate to in things that have been done before, but not, no precedent for it. And the very early work was a simple taking a piece of rubber about yeah, four feet wide and about eight feet long, grabbing it on, on its edge, and just lifting it up, and it was called to lift. When, once I stood that up, I realized that I could accept the topological continuousness of this form as a sculpture. Now, the immediate generation that had come before had dealt with the hierarchy of the object, and they weren't involved with the process of the material, and they had specific intentions. Well, I was more interested in my own physical experience than somebody else's intention. I wasn't interested in script. I was interested in how I could physically interact with material and what the residue would be in terms of anyone looking at it being able to reconstruct what had been done. Whether or not that was satisfying aesthetically for other people or not, at, the point, at that point didn't um, concern me. And I, I was working with various people. I had a small trucking company. So it was myself, Chuck, 
uh, Phil Glass, uh, Bob Fiore, Michael Snow, Steve Reich. So there were a lot of painters, um, other sculptors, filmmakers, musicians who would help me. Mm -hmm. And there was a dialogue that went on between us that was involved with process, time, movement, place, that um, didn't really adhere to any discipline. So there was an interconnectedness in the language that we all shared, and there wasn't any competition about one outdoing the other because we were all involved with a similar language, which up to that point really hadn't hit the museums. We were doing the work for each other. Does this resonate with you, John? Yeah, I was, uh, um, I remember being in Richard's studio when he says, look at this. <laughs> and he reaches down, he lifts the thing up, and we're like, oh, wow, you know, this is really an amazing, uh, amazing thing. And, and um, but I, I think in terms of, uh, you know, how we ended up doing what we're doing, I think there's a, uh, a common misunderstanding about how uh, generations of artists uh, 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 move um, uh, away from other people's work. There's a commonly held belief that we're reacting against work that we find bankrupt, uninteresting, devoid of any value, and therefore you go out and make something else. I thought we, we loved all those people so much, <laughs> and uh, we thought we were going to be doomed to be uh, followers if we continued to make work that looked like everyone else. Our generation really wanted to create something that was not familiar. And I think um, to make something that is unfamiliar is actually probably to make something new and to create something. To make something familiar is to deal with facts that have come before. And um, in watching the segments of these pro this program, uh, I didn't watch the last few, but I was struck that the passion of scientists trying to deal with something in relation to the given history of facts and then offering something new, I think is probably um, fairly consistent with how a lot of artists work. Eric? This is what struck me, and Ann also made this point. There, there must be a common sort of set of stages whereby people solve problems uh, in so what I other people see. I think problem solving is not the issue. I think that's uh, problem creation is so Sorry, much more right. interesting. Selecting what is the interesting problem. You, I think what, what we did was uh, try and find a way, you know, to back ourselves in our own individual corner and ask questions of ourselves that no one else's answers would fit. And then you, then the search was, uh, was on. But again, it was a choice not to do something. Ad Reinhardt was very important for me. I don't know if he was for you, but he, his writings were. But he made the choice not to do something a positive decision. No more of this. No more of that. Mm. We, we're not going to do this anymore. We're not going to do that anymore. And it, I thought, oh my God, if I want to move not necessarily progress, but if I want to move from where I am, I can construct a series of severe self-imposed limitations. If, if I'm going to uh, you know, make something, uh, then I'm going to say, I'm going to purge my work of uh, virtuoso brushmanship, I'm going to try and get the artist's hand out of there, I'm going to limit myself uh, to one color, just black paint on thin down on a white canvas, uh, I, I, my hand wants to make art shapes, so I'll work from photographs, so the shapes have to be the shapes in the photograph. Uh, I'm plagued with indecision, and, and I paint it in, scrape it off, so I'm only going to work with one color, so that, uh, that I'm forced to make decisions early and live with it. Purge the work of, of, uh, uh, of everything else. And even in terms of a personal characterization, these look much more like the kind of photo on a driver's license or a passport. Right. No posing that. Right. Um, to, yeah. it, it is interesting since you have difficulty recognizing faces. How did you focus in on becoming a portrait artist? Well, uh, everything in my work is driven by my learning disabilities. Every single aspect of my work, and uh, you know, besides There's hope uh, for all of us. <laughs> uh, besides. Uh, uh, face blindness, I was very severely learning disabled, and I couldn't add or subtract or multiply or divide. Dyslexia. Yeah. Well, in the 40s and 50s, nobody knew from dyslexia or learning disabilities. You were just dumb and lazy. <laughs> uh, and uh, so what, what happened was I had to find uh, a way um, 
to distinguish myself from um, my colleagues. I was not good at a lot of other things, virtually any other thing. And it wasn't that I cared more, uh, or, you know, I just, I wasn't more talented. I just, I had all my eggs in that basket. And if this didn't work out, I was... But uh, white faces? Good. Well, um, you know, I'm really glad Cezanne painted apples, and I'm really glad <laughs> Rand Randy painted bottles. But, but I'm, I, I don't want to do that. And uh, I am, uh, since I'm face blind, I, I want to commit images to memory. Uh, and uh, so Richard, as a sculptor, um, I could never in a million years be a sculptor. I'm totally flat. When I tried to make sculpture, I only worked on one side. So uh, uh, I, if, if I look at you and you move your head half an inch, it's a new head that I've never seen before. But if I, <laughs> but if we take a photograph and flatten it out, I now affect a translation from one flat medium to another. And that's become more and more true for you. Yeah, uh, you've gotten older, it's become more and more true. This gentleman, Oliver, is also face blind and is also fantastically creative. Do you think so, that your face blindness in any way contributes to your creativity, Oliver? Um, <clears throat> well, it makes it necessary for me to observe voice and posture and movement and context. That's interesting. More, more precisely. It made you a better clinician in a way. Perhaps so. Based on what we've talked about before in terms of the origins of creativity, um, where does it come from for you? Uh, need. Uh, <laughs> um, the, uh, and I think not prime, perhaps need to communicate. In, uh, in Nathaniel Hawthorne, in his preface to his Twice Told Tales, said that his, uh, um, his art was not a communing of the soul with itself, but an attempt, however imperfect, to establish an intercourse with the world. Mm -hmm. And whether it is faces or sculptures or music or science, one, um, one wants some sort of resonance, one wants an mm -hmm. intercourse, one wants an exchange. Yes, if you hold yes. a share in everything. Well, one thing that both artists' work shares to a really interesting extent for me, thinking about how different they are, is the priority on the viewer's experience. And I think Chuck's paintings, if we could look at the Roy Lichtenstein portrait, um, there is obviously a back and forth in these pictures between the abstract marks, the painting act, and the representation of somebody. And neither one is the whole experience. Part of the experience is the abstract circles and squares and funny shapes that you see in the mm. detail. And Wonderful. then part of it is, oh, but here's this person. And for Chuck making it, as much or more for the viewer looking at that painting, one is made to become aware of one's own perception and one's own use mm -hmm. of one's perception because you have to look at this painting up close to see the free abstraction mm -hmm. of the brushwork, of the shapes that are made, the color forms. And then you, you step back to see, oh, there's Roy Lichtenstein. Mm -hmm. And the process that you went through in making it is so embedded in the painting that as the viewer, yeah, you are evidence. almost made to recreate it. And both of us, all the evidence of its own yes. making is right there yes. in the work itself. The fact that there are incremental units, which is true from the very beginning, even the continuous tone paintings were made in incremental uh, units, is also driven by my learning disability. I was overwhelmed by the whole. I didn't have any... Uh, how am I going to make a head? How am I going to make a nose? It's too overwhelming. Uh, it makes me too anxious. Uh, but if I break it down into a lot of little decisions, lots of... This was a coping mechanism that I used all the way through, uh, through school in everything that I did. Uh, take something uh, overwhelming and, and anxiety-provoking and make it into little not so scary decisions and have it be a positive uh, experience because every time I did completed a square, I didn't have to wait till the end to get pleasure. I could solve one <laughs> little problem at a time and the pleasure came with, 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 each, with each one of those. And this is um, 
Uh, this was uh, very, um, you know, reassuring. Yes. That each one is slightly different. I mean, the number of decisions that are involved, and you described that you painstakingly work at each of them to see that the colors matched and the forms matched. It's really quite amazing. Well, an interesting thing about this painting was I could have done it with a diagonal grid or with a horizontal vertical grid. If I'd made it with a diagonal grid, his nose would have been a ski jump. Now, the iconography would have stayed exactly the same. It would have been Roy, and, and it would have, they would have looked the same, especially reduced. But I decided that I wanted to do a horizontal vertical grid so your eye would splash down those shapes like water over rocks on a waterfall. And even though the nose would be the same in either case, it was an entirely different experience. And uh, that's, you know, you're trying, I'm an orchestrator of experiences. That's what I try to do. I mean, I think it's very rare for a painter or a sculptor to be as explicit about that um, interest in the viewer's experience. But I mean, Richard, for you to imagine it's the opposite. You didn't get any step-by-step uh, -step gratification at all. And for you to be able to go from an idea in your head to what it is when these things are complete that will make the viewer's experience be what it is you are envisioning it to be, can you at all? describe that? Um, I went from ver very simple things. I went from um, conical shapes which were inverted that would allow shapes to lean away from you or if you turn one upside down they would lean toward you um, to then dealing with um, torque shapes and it evolved into a series of torqued ellipses and torque passageways where the viewer is experiencing a, a space um, that he's implicated in that is somewhat startling in that they have no um, previous information that would allow them to understand the complexity of a curve leaning toward you and away from you uh, in its simultaneity as you move through. And it gave me a big opening into developing a language. I think what is interesting about this is that one generally thinks of the, uh, the beholder share, the observer's participation in the art, as a moderately stationary experience. Now certainly with certain conventional sculpture you walk around a bit. But yours opened up a completely new response. This is really a, you know, a long walk that you take in some of these. Uh, and the emotion changes as you move through it. I'm as interested in not just the material of the steel but the void. So the steel is just a vessel that allows one to understand one's physical relation to the space. space. In the way that this room is mm -hmm. round, mm -hmm. we know it in one particular way and it's centered with this table. If it's rectilinear and this was a rectilinear table, we would know each other's response very, very differently. Those kinds of things have always interested me. Since I was a kid, walking one way on the beach and walking backward the other way completely confounded me. And, uh, those very simple things, being in a telephone booth as differentiating from being in a, in a football stadium, I could never quite get back together in my head. Yeah, at one point I was building a work uh, for Jasper Johns in his studio and I was splashing lead and I'd splash some lead against the wall and Jasper asked me if I would build a piece for him in his studio and, and I had a piece of lead with me and I thought, why don't I just cast off this piece of lead, I'll shove it in the corner. And, and when I put it in the corner, Stuck. I realized <laughs> that, oh, the corner is holding the sheet of lead up. And I thought, I wonder. And so I went on and made the Jasper Johns piece, and immediately it got me out of the studio. I went and asked for, for a rigger, got a plate uh, 10 by 20 feet long, put it in the corner, it bisected the room, it made the whole volume of the room an installation, it made the space of the place as interesting as the steel plate itself. And the architecture, just by bisecting the corner, was supporting the work. So there wasn't any welding, nothing, no support. The architecture itself was holding the work in place. But it, it's always in the, the process of working itself that Absolutely. ideas lead to other ideas for me because the work isn't scripted or confined only to um, its notion of making, but in the process of um, it revealing itself to me is when I learn what is possible that I hadn't foreseen in what I projected. And um, one doesn't want to become a slave to one's own precedence, and the way to get around that is to constantly stay aware and ask questions about what it is I'm looking at and what it is I don't understand. And oftentimes when pieces are coming together, you see things that you could not have imagined, and they 
push you in a different direction. The same for you, Joe. This is very important. Um, I've always said, uh, for a long time, I've said inspiration is for amateurs. <laughs> the rest of us just show up and get to work. It's <laughs> <That's> great. <laughs> because everything grows out of work. Absolutely. You do something, and that kicks open a door, and you look through that door, and you go, I want to go there, yes, so you right, move right through. Everything comes, uh, comes from uh, that, um, uh, that kind of approach to, uh, you yeah. know, you don't want to sit around and wait for the clouds to part and be struck in the head with a bolt of lightning because it may never happen. You don't sit, you don't get up in the morning and say, I have to be creative. Right, no. <laughs> it's, not word, it's not a word that we use. You don't, I'm sorry, you don't even we use don't the word. We use it and we don't use inspiration and we don't use terms like that. So it only happens when you do what? Sometimes it's because you put yourself in a position where you're more likely to bump into something. Did you once tell me that the creative process that you engage in, whatever word we use instead of creative process, creating art, mm -hmm. making art, uh, you only take it halfway then the person who receives it takes it the rest of the way. Uh, yeah, well actually Duchamp said that. The artist had only 50% of the responsibility. I never and interviewed Duchamp. <laughs> and, uh, and that was to, to put the work out. But the piece was completed when, he, when the viewer right, returned right. it uh, to the artist. And we are in a business of visual communication. And I think this is a very important point because it also points out that creativity insight is not just the, the artist's domain. The person who responds to the art also is undergoing a creative process. And part of the pleasure is the working through of what the art means to them. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, the, and the process for you becomes when the people are inside of the sculpture. Yes. Our generation was very involved with the material aspects and one's response to the material aspects and how one could um, produce a certain effect through an activity with this physical aspects. I'm not sure that um, as mediaization comes in and virtual reality takes over and people are being immersed in the spectacular, whether those notions of materiality still hold. I think Anne may be able to speak to it because she's probably more abreast of what kids in their 20s or 30s are doing than I am, but it seems to me that the um, emphasis on understanding the logic of material and the manifestation of material in relation to form and basically what I do is try to invent form, form that hasn't been predicated on past forms. I think that's what sculptors have always done. That seems to be almost the mandate. But I'm not sure if, if younger generations care about that, those criteria or those notions in the way that seem to be um, what my task had to be. What do we know about the biology of creativity? Um, well, well, in a word, not, not too much. Not too much. <laughs> um, um, but it certainly entails the lifting of various inhibitions and restraints as well as, as, well as stimuli. And uh, you were speaking before about the two halves of the brain and how different they are. And, uh, and certainly when the left half of the brain, which is more concerned with language and abstract thought, gets damaged, as it may in some diseases or with a stroke, you may have a release of, uh, of perceptual powers and artistic powers from, from the other hemisphere. But... Uh, Do you think the fact that we both have face blindness, is there a, a, an area of damage in both of our brains um, that yes. can be pointed to? Yes. Yes, I, 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 I say that not area. so much damage as a, a failure of development. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, yes, and a failure of development in, in areas which are similar to those in people who've had strokes or whatever and suddenly lose facial recognition. There, there is an amazingly large representation in the brain of faces. There are six or seven what are called face patches, in which you record from them, you see that 90% of the cells respond to faces. Mm -hmm. And it is, there are, you know much better than I do, but there are different kinds of face blindness. There, blindnesses in which you don't recognize a face as a face at all, and the blindness in which I recognize a face, but I don't know it's Chuck Close's face. So you have no difficulty recognizing the object as a face, but you can't I identify it as a specific person. Uh, and the areas that are involved in that have, have been recognized. These areas don't respond if you just show two dots for an eye and a nose in between. It has to be surrounded by a circle, so you get the sort of 
the, the feeling of an actual face being there. And as in caricature, the more you exaggerate the face, the more dramatic the cells respond. So if you push the eyes apart or you bring them together, the cells respond more dramatically. And this is one of the reasons probably why expressionism in art is so effective. Mm -hmm. Let me just ask both of you this. Suppose there would be someone who you'd never seen before mm -hmm. come into your field of vision. Right. What would you see? I would see them, but I, the next day I wouldn't recognize them. That's would not recognize them the next day. No. It's the identity association with the face. You have to see it over and over. Yeah. What would be very interesting about Richard's brain is he's very space conscious. And there is an area in the brain that's specialized in space. It's called the hippocampus. It's also involved in memory. And if you look at London taxi drivers, who unlike New York taxi drivers, really know the way around town. They have to take examinations. The size of the hippocampus varies as a function of how long they've been driving. Wow. Wow. So the longer they drive, the longer, within limits, the hippocampus <laughs> becomes. And if you ask a taxi driver right now to think of going from one place to another in London, the hippocampus lights up. I don't recognize faces, but I have an incredible uh, facility in finding Space where I'm going. Of, that's wonderful. Largely because I can't remember the address, I have to know how to get there uh, using other uh, indicators. And I feel like I am floating over the world. I see the entire world in plan. And I know I'm going to go here for a while, then I'm going to turn left, and then when I get there, I'm going to turn right, and I'm going to get where I'm going. I could draw you a floor plan of virtually every room I have ever been in in my life. Um, from the time that I was four or five years old. And that, that I mean, I think that nature does, I, I would be totally lost, as Oliver often is, not being able to find where he's uh, going. But this, this uh, uh, ability seems to have been developed to mitigate for my inability to remember an address or uh, anything let, like that. Let me ask you this, um, because we touched on this earlier. Right, right brain, left brain. What's the evidence that if there is something, something wrong with right or left brain, it enhances the ability of the other? Um, perhaps some of the clearest evidence or suggestion uh, is the occurrence of diseases or damage right. to one hemisphere. There is. So, a for, give me an example. So, if your if your light is right, if your vision is impaired. So, in this frontotemporal dementia. Uh, part of the temporal lobe is affected in the left hemisphere and then there tends to be some release of activities in the right hemisphere. 40 year old man who did very little painting all of a sudden has an outburst of painting as a result of this. Um, or, or an outburst of musicality. Musicality. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, there's another interesting thing is uh, Beeman and Cunius, two young investigators who've been using different approaches to study what is called the Eureka phenomenon or the AHA phenomenon. So I can give you a problem that you can solve in one way systematically by going through the alternatives and immediately seeing the answer. If you see the answer immediately, have an AHA phenomenon, a certain area in the right temporal lobe lights up. And this is, you know, in a variety of different tasks. So even though this is very early stage, one is beginning to get some insight into the fact that, you know, some aspects of creativity, this isn't going to cover all of it, seems to be in recruiting the right hemisphere. Being an artist and a scientist both, in, is there a difference in scientific creativity and what we might call artistic creativity, for the lack of a better word? Um, well, it, it's easy to argue both for the similarities and, and against them. Um, the uh, a, uh, a great physicist who was also a very fine amateur pianist has a, a chapter in his autobiography um, called Mo Mozart and, Qu and Quantum Mechanics. <laughs> and um, he says that for him, when he's doing one or the other, they're profoundly different. I mean, um, for me, uh, narrative, which is my medium, uh, somehow seems to combine them all the while, or at least I, I hope it does. Mm. Um, I think the problem that Chuck and I may have with the word creativity is that seen from the outside, it seems like a very exalted term and people, mm. you know, attribute various status symbols to it or whatever. Seen from the inside, it's probably an unending question mark, if not a, 
paranoia and uh, um, paranoia or sublimation. And that, that's an interesting um, point I'd like to bring up. How does one account in science or in brain science for the um, activity of sublimation? Or is it accounted for? Because it certainly is apparent to me that, and I just gave a talk on Louise Bourgeois who talked about it all her life, um, that her sexual drive was sublimated in her, her work. That was the manifestation of her work. Now, it does sublimation play a role, or have they found, does it play a role in the synapses that occur in the brain? Yeah, no. I, yes, well, yeah. I, I think there may be an, an interesting historical example with Herman Melville. Um, Herman Melville wrote several very popular novels, Omu, Taipei, and so forth, in the 1840s. He was highly ta talented, but not particularly original. And then something happened around 1850. He fell in love, and in fact he fell in love uh, with Nathaniel Hawthorne. Oh. And this was not reciprocated, mm. and therefore the libido had no didn't have its normal outlet. And um, it was in this state of uh, passion and restraint that Moby Dick emerged, <laughs> a work of genius from, uh, from the first sentence. I, I, so we can I, thank, I, so I, the uh, lesson of this, we can thank Nathaniel Hawthorne for no Moby Dick. And then Nathaniel Hawthorne, I think, thanked Melville with a really great, great I, article I, I, I about that novel right away. That. That's a very nice story, but I would not generalize from this. Okay, well, stay, stay with me, because it's very interesting. I, it's because a, you, as well, a because scientist... I know many scientists and many artists who have a fantastically rich sexual life. It, it, it enhances their productivity rather than decreases it. So I think there are a thousand ways to be creative, a lot of different ways. What I think is a similarity between... Uh, artists and scientists, which e emerged very interestingly is defining the problem, finding mm. the problem. I think in the scientific career, finding an interesting problem is one of the most important aspects of it, a problem that has a future to it that you see is not going to be a one-shot affair. This makes me think of an artist of their generation, a great German sculptor, Joseph Beuys, and his most famous assertion was that everyone is an artist. And I think a lot of what these men have been saying is that yes, their processes can be extended to the way a scientist works, to the way a banker works, a baker works. There's a certain amount of... Creativity in all of us. In everybody. And the kinds of normal ways in which they go from day to day and year to year in their work can be shared by people who are doing other this things. This is the and identification yet, of the artist with the worker, I think. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And, and we started early there, and I think that's a very important but, point. And yeah. yet, and yet, you're Richard Serra. Exactly. You are Chuck Close, Ex Oliver Sacks, sure, Eric Kandel. Sure. There somehow is the ultimate mystery of what is the distinction between the people with those achievements and, yes, great to think about everyone in an art, as an artist and yeah, thinking yeah, of ourselves that way every day. What's the difference between everybody has the capacity to engage in a process of asking questions and making decisions and a Richard Serra? who's done it at a level that at the end of the road there is something extraordinary that people pay homage to. I think that it has a lot to do with in internal motivation about what, why you're driven and I can't answer that question. I mean I was in analysis for eight years, I still can't answer that question. The question of why you're driven? Why you're driven, why you're driven, why I'm driven to, to want to invent form. I can't answer or that. Or why question. I work so hard, or whatever. But there are a lot of there yeah. are sure, sure. Uh, thousands so, of good Oliver. artists. Um, one drive for me uh, depends on the fact that I feel like I cannot appropriate experience or come to terms with it completely until it is rendered into language. So I have to write. How, how, how do I know what I think unless I read what I write? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> beautiful. That was awesome. Beautiful. 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 Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Yeah. So what's the takeaway on creativity here? The takeaway is, um, for me, there's a lot we can know by um, circumstance, behavior, psychology, and so on. Way, way more we can't yeah. know, Absolutely. can't understand Chuck, at this point. Chuck, what's the takeaway? I've known Richard for a long time, but I've never seen him more excited than when he's explaining an idea.
Oh, when he goes, when he, you know, I've been with you when you've taken some lead and rolled it up and shoved it in the sand and would explain to me how this bisects the, uh, the, the uh, shape. And, and um, you know, you light up. You light up in a way. And your, your desire to share. Artists are very generous people. Uh, we're also narcissistic and self-involved, but... We uh, the there is Unlike this, the rest of us. Um, <laughs> there, there is a desire to share this, and there's a little bit of the child in all of us that's saying, "Look at me! I am here! I am somebody! Let me take you on a little voyage! I'm going to show you something! I'm going to take you somewhere! I'll make an experience for you, and uh, and I I hope you enjoy it." I'll ask you a different question, Oliver. What what? What is it you most want to understand as a scientist and as a person who engages it in a narrative form about the act of creating and creativity? No. Uh, I want to understand how the new can come into being. Uh, and uh, this, this um, uh, again, to, uh, I want to give, give a, a concrete example. A little bit was said earlier about imitation being bad. Mm -hmm. I think imitation may be an essential preliminary to any achievement. And for example, with a, uh, uh, a poet like Pope, like Alexander Pope, his first published poems were called Imitations of English Poets. And um, he is first concerned to to get the technique or to develop the language, as, as you said, Richard, and only when it's developed, he then infuses it with his imagination. Um, but you can't have anything new until a great deal has become automatic and second nature. But um, it is, uh, uh, I think, the spontaneous, spontaneity and novelty uh, are the most challenging problems in the world. When we were at Yale... We the, being you and Richard. Was, yeah, uh, and you know, there were so many other interesting people there at the same time. Um, we unabashedly worked through other people's work. We were students, and we... Uh, I mean, you could always tell who Richard was into because all the pages of the book were glued together with paint. Because his books would be spread in his studio, and he would work through, you know, Suti, and he worked through everybody. And we knew that we were doing that as an exercise. We were not appropriating. And I think what Oliver is saying is very true. You get your chops by, uh, by digesting other people's creativity. And that will put you in a position where once you leave it alone, you're going to be able to find something um, more personal. If, if you can leave it alone, you may be stuck in imitation and virtuosity for your whole I life. I think that's a problem with appropriation as a prime yeah. modus operandi. <laughs> Um, very hard but to but um, I, and it may not occur early in life. Say with someone like Wagner, um, all his early works, Rienzi and Lohengrin, they sound a bit like Rossini, like Meyerbeer, like Mendelssohn. They're all mixed together. And then suddenly, when he's 40 years old in Tristan, he does something which has never been done before. Uh, in, in particular, a, um, a dominant seventh in music always resolves but he opens the overture to Tristan with a dominant seventh, which is the resolution. This sounds tiny, but it was unprecedented. And this, for him, opened the door to music, which I, I hate, but which is but you original make, you, and powerful. You, you make a point, and that is that in addition to having ideas, selecting a problem, you have to have competence. And one of the ways of developing competence is the just learning, learning the task, well, seeing how other Chuck people has, solve the yeah, problem. Yeah, Chuck has this great comment about how you made more de Koonings than de Kooning, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> there, is, there is one interesting well, thing. I said th to him, there, when I finally met him, I said, uh, it's very nice to meet somebody who's made a few more de Koonings than yeah, that. That's, that's <laughs> but I think what it says is that it's not just newness, it's greatness. Because unless the yes. newness contains yes. within it what came before, it's not going to achieve that stature. Yeah. Okay. yeah. systems and limitations free up intuition. When I was free to do anything I wanted to do, I did the same things over and over and over. Once I constructed a situation in which I, uh, you know, I couldn't do certain things, uh, I found that those limitations, rather than constricting me and rather than limiting what I could do, 
uh, on the other, uh, on the contrary, opened things up, and I was far more intuitive than I ever had been without those limitations. All right, I got to close it. Go ahead, I, go ahead, I make the point. I think there are two other points that emerge from this. One is we realize that from a variety of levels, we know very little about creativity. And this should inspire people who are looking for new areas to investigate, <laughs> to really look into this, uh, number one. And number two, the two of you give a remarkable example that we've seen in other contexts as well, and that is the social determinants of creativity. You are a wonderful generation of students you must have had a faculty at least encouraged, permitted at this. And to think that the environment so much encouraged your creativity, two outstanding artists that come out of a one class at Bryce Yale. Bryce Martin also. Bryce Martin. Right. Rex Rodin. Rex Rodin's John So, Fish, uh, so that's Harrison. amazing. That, 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 that there are social determinants that, that encourage the outburst of creativity. That's very important. And it was the, the Yale atmosphere, I think you have to um, also stress, was repeated in downtown New York at the end of the in 60s. Soho. Yes, right. where they all ended up and all worked together and, and helped each other. And helped Richard, I want to get the last word to you since. Um, I, this. I think what I, I'm interested in is consciousness and how the brain actually um, allows people to become more conscious. Just what, how, how does one understand others in relation to oneself? And where is it that, what triggers that consciousness of the other? There, we actually had a whole program on this. That is the biology of empathy. How I have an idea of where you're at and where you're going and what your aspirations are as a different person than myself. And we're beginning to develop some idea of certain areas of the brain and how that functions. But I want to say that the two issues that you've brought up, which you want to understand more creativity and consciousness, are, you know, we're very far away from understanding that. But Hopefully, you know, we want to give something for the younger people to do. And um, I feel my job in neuroscience is to give uh, job opportunities for future nurse and neuroscientists. Uh, on that note, thank you very much. Um, Chuck Close, thank you. Thank you, um, Ann Temkin, and Chief Curator MoMA, Oliver Sachs, Columbia University Neurologist. It's great to see you. I should note that you're wearing this cap not because we want to promote anything, <laughs> but because you thought it would shield you uh, sensitive eyes from the bright television lights. Um, we're thrilled to have you here with or without a hat. So thank you very much, Eric Kapp. And Eric Kandel and I have been on a journey. Uh, it has been a journey uh, that I have learned as much as I have on any series. Uh, it has opened us up to enormous possibilities. And I think Eric and I could sit here tonight and say, let's go do 10 parts on creativity. Uh, just the questions we have raised at this table this evening uh, show you the extraordinary thing we've been talking about, which is you know, th that as we understand the complexity of the brain just a little bit, it opens up and shows us the possibilities of understanding so much more and understanding who we are and understanding where uh, what we thought of as, in a sense, uh, didn't quite understand about uh, behavior and how there was a, a connection to biology. Uh, and Eric has helped us understand that, and, and uh, he is my great friend, and he has uh, been the guiding hand and the guiding light and the guiding mind uh, well, on this Well, it's been process. a shared experience, if so I may interrupt you. I am pleased to say uh, this is 12 parts. Uh, we will do more. Uh, but I am thankful to you this evening, and I am thankful to I'm thankful Eric. to you.